Right, good morning everyone. Welcome to Darby Creek Church. Thanks so much for coming. It's good to see you this morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Uh, we're going to start out with a, a responsive reading from the Psalms, all right? So we need participation from you. I'm going to read the odd lines, the first one and following, and you guys can read the the even lines. So give it, give it lots of enthusiasm. Say it like you mean it, okay? All right, here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Give thanks to Him who alone does mighty miracles. Give thanks to Him who made the heavens so skillfully. Amen. Let's praise Him. Let's pray to Him and thank Him. Lord God, we do want to thank you this morning for your faithful love, for all of your goodness and kindness to us. And uh, we want to draw near to you right now, God. We want to worship you. Pray that you would just forgive us our sins, God, and all the things, all the ways that we've fallen short. God, just forgive us. Draw us near. Thank you for the blood of your Son that cleanses us and help us to, to worship and grow in you. In Jesus' name. All right, if you're comfortable standing, please stand and we'll sing. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. Turn me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Forever free, I am not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. <laughs> Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning Oh, like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friend Burden and bitterness, you can just keep it moving Cause you're not welcome here anymore From now till I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you save my soul This wayward signs found its way back home You pick me up, you turn me around You place my feet on solid ground I thank you, Master, I thank you, Savior Because you healed my heart, you changed my name I think to save ya, I think I lost another one and I am free. Oh I am free, oh I am free. Hell lost another one and I am free. I am free, oh I am free. Hell lost another one and I am free. I thank you, Master, I thank you, Savior, because He healed my heart, He 
change my name Forever free I am not the same I think master I think savior I think get up, get up, get up Hey, get up by that grave Get up, get up, get up Hey, get up by that grave Get up, get up, get up Hey, get up by that grave Get up, get up, get up Hey, get up by that grave Amen, yeah, praise him Thank the Master. Amen. That's awesome. All right, this is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. It says this, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave us our sins. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. Amen. Let's thank our God for all those good things. They all came to us because Jesus went to the cross. Right? Let's see.
Lord. All right, you may have a seat, Pastor. Greg. This this morning, um, we're going to be just continuing our series, kind of getting us focused up on what we want to, as a church body, to be thinking about um, in terms of uh, throughout the year. And it's kind of a, a church theme of ours is this passage here, and particularly Acts two forty two, uh, which I'll, I'll read for you in just a second. But we're just going through this series. This is the third week in it, and then uh, we'll finish it uh, next week, and then we'll be we'll be upon Easter, um, and we'll have a special message for Easter Sunday. So, um, but you know, there's a. Uh, there's something about today as we talk about uh, that these believers were devoted to the breaking of bread, uh, which is just another uh, phrase for communion or the Lord's Supper that I think is, is good because sometimes we don't understand really what the purpose of that is and why it's so important as a church family uh, for us to be doing this. In fact, you know, it's really one of two church ordinances that Jesus commanded uh, the first is water baptism, okay? He commanded that we be baptized, if you remember in the Great Commission, right? Uh, that we, uh, uh, people to be baptized. And that really is, uh, that particular ordinance, uh, water baptism, is a, an illustration, uh, if you will, sort of a, a initiation, a rite of initiation celebrating being born again. And that occurs once, right? Because you're only born again once, Right? So it makes, makes sense that baptism, water baptism is done once um, in celebrating someone coming to faith in Christ. And then uh, the second church ordinance that the Lord told us to do is communion or breaking bread or the Lord's Supper. And he instituted that uh, there at the Last Supper with his disciples. And uh, he, this was to be a continual thing um, compared uh, or contrasted with Baptism, just a one-time event. But both uh, what we consider to be church ordinances, things that are to be practiced that our Lord commanded us to do. And so um, it can be easy for us to uh, become so familiar with these things that we kind of forget what the purpose is uh, and the significance. And so uh, hopefully today that uh, we will be reminded of the importance of communion and what it's about. We're not taking communion today. Um, but, um, but we're going to spend time kind of looking into the Scriptures about it. So let's, let's go ahead to prayer this morning uh, before we get into God's Word. Lord, thank you for um, just the communion. Thank you for the breaking of bread. Uh, there, there are several reasons why you instituted this, as we'll look into, but God, we just thank you that you've given us these reminders even baptism, you, you give us this, these um, word pictures, these ways of acting out, uh, acting these things out that remind us of uh, spiritual realities in our lives. And so, um, uh, thank you, God, that you've, you've given us these, uh, in a sense, as a gift. And so, Lord, we, we want to uh, know more about it, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just give us understanding, clarify any uh, misunderstanding we might have as to the reason for uh, this ordinance of communion. And Lord, we just pray that also this morning, God, uh, that you would uh, draw us close to yourself, that you would um, help us, Lord, that, that we would, we would um, you know, if there's anything in, in, in the way of our relationship with you, God, that's, that's taking precedent over you that shouldn't, Lord, we just pray that you'd bring those things to mind, Lord, and we would want to confess to you that, Lord, we, you need to be first place in our lives. And, and Lord, uh, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ who went to the cross for, uh, to, to bear our sin, to pay the penalty for our sin. And thank you, Lord, that he rose again from the dead and he defeated death. He, and so, Lord, that anyone who puts their faith in Jesus can be born again, and can have eternal life. Lord, so we ask and pray that you bless our time now. Lord, we pray that you would uh, especially be present and strengthen and encourage those in our church body who are struggling, who need uh, your help, Lord, for physical healing or for spiritual strength, Lord. We pray that you would just give it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Like I said, we're talking about being de- these, um, the first church, the first century church was devoted to a number of things. There are four things listed in Acts uh, 2.42, and uh, I'll just go ahead and read this for you, just the first verse, and then we'll stand for the others. But it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which we talked about, and the fellowship, which we talked about last week, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so uh, we also learned when we did the first message in this series that this is an ongoing devotion, right? That this, this is the verb that's used here is an ongoing tense, something that is continuing. So it's not like we say, okay, got that, apostles teaching. Okay, got that, the fellowship, right? This is something that we're, we're continually being devoted to. And the church was then, and so should we be now, okay? So if you're comfortable and standing, you're able to stand. Why don't you head stand with me as I read this passage, which, by the way, is probably one of the longest passages that actually talks, that's related to communion that we have. Um, you know, so because when you have Jesus instituting um, the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper, it's a very short section, right? And so I'm going to read this passage that Paul wrote in a letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 17 to 34. It says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves... We would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you shall all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, and so when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. This is God's word. Please have a seat. So you can see from the tone of what we just read is uh, Paul is getting pretty serious with um, what he's talking to these believers about uh, when they gather together. He had some strong words for them, some words of correction. But in those words of correction, we also see uh, some of the, the, the reasons or the importance and the purpose of the breaking of bread. So I'm going to use, look at this passage from that vantage point. Now, I will say, um, I'm going to focus on the things that are clear in this passage. There are a number of things in this passage and phrases and wordings that are very difficult and a lot of people do not agree on. So uh, I'm going to focus on the clear, okay? And, um, uh, and we, just, we just do the best uh, we can. Uh, with the other parts that we don't understand, okay? So, all right, so, so we're going to look at the importance of the purpose 
uh, of the breaking of bread, which again, uh, another wording for this is uh, the Lord's Supper, which is used in this passage right here in 1 Corinthians. Uh, breaking your bread is what we saw in, in Acts 2.42. Um, and, and we call it communion, typically, right? That's what it's called um, in, in many churches today, is communion. And so what I'd look at, like to look at here in, in the first place is that uh, breaking a bread, it, it is a symbol of the unity of the church. It's a symbol of the unity of the church. And as we look at uh, some of the verses I just read, like, for example, when you look at verse 18, in the first place, he says, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. And you see that phrase? It's when you come together. These things are happening when the church was gathering, right? And so, and then in verse 20, it says, so then when you come together, it is, it, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. So, so he, he's saying, he's giving instructions about when they come together, and one of the things they're to do when they come together is to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It, it is, in, in one sense, it is a symbol of their unity, okay? It is a symbol of their unity. In fact, if you back up in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that is, and look in, in chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verses 16 and 17, listen to what Paul says here. Uh, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Verse 17, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Right? So uh, when, when the, um, the Lord instituted uh, the Last Supper, Right, he he had this bread, loaf of bread, and he broke it, right, and then they passed it out to those that were participating. But it came from one loaf, right. And so Paul here in First Corinthians ten in those verses, he's saying, listen, this is also just a reminder that we are one body, right, and, and because of our faith in Christ, it unites us in a unique way. And I touched on that a lot last week because I talked about being devoted to the fellowship, right. The fellowship, and in fact, the words that we just read there in verse 16, that word participation is rooted in the same word as fellowship, okay? So, um, so there's a fellowship that we have with the Lord, we know, because of our union with Christ, because of our faith in Him, and there's a fellowship that we have with one another because of that union with Christ, right? Now, so, so it is a reminder right, that when we come together and we take communion, right, that we are one body because of what he did. We are to be united. Now, as you can see from our reading there in 1 Corinthians 11, now, they may have been one body, but they weren't acting like it, right? They were not acting um, as one. And they had a, a number of issues that were going on, and um, I mean, there were divisions among the church, and you can even see this in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians, right? Uh, they, they, had, they were divided on, you know, uh, they were aligning themselves with different leaders in the church. I am, um, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos, you know. Woo, you know, I'm team green and I'm team red or whatever, you know. Something along those lines when it came to leaders in the church. So they were divided in that way, but here they're divided uh, also in another way. And it seems to be, as we read these verses, that... It was along socioeconomic lines, okay, because it talks about um, there that, you know, when they're gathering together, um, and by the way, um, our church history tells us they, they would have these gatherings, they call them love feasts. There would be a meal involved and then followed by the Lord's Supper where they would celebrate communion, okay? And so in these love feasts, right, what was happening is... and um, is that it seems that the, those who are more well-to-do, um, uh, they were able to show up early and start eating, and they weren't waiting for those who were poorer or maybe even slaves or servants who couldn't show up till later till their work was done. And as a result, you know, you, you walk in and all the wealthy, a lot of the wealthy people 
had already eaten almost everything, and they were, had plenty of wine. It says some of, you know, they were drunk. And so then they're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, right? This, this thing that's in, in part, it symbolizes their unity. It was like they were going through the motions. They weren't united. They weren't acting like one body, right? They were, they were, um, they were not, the, the people who were wealthier that were doing these things obviously were totally disrespecting those who'd um, who were poorer and couldn't be there earlier. And so Paul gives instructions here. Yeah, you guys, if you're hungry, eat before you come. Then maybe you can have some more when the others, when everybody's there, right? So it was, um, there was division along these lines. There was disharmony in the church. And so instead of building each other up in Christian unity, what should be happening in the gatherings, the opposite was happening. It's almost like Paul's saying it'd be better if you didn't get together because when you're getting together, it's not helping. And so he really is, um, he really is saying, you guys are kind of really, you're kind of forgetting what, uh, that you're actually pulling from the same loaf when we're having communion, when we're having the Lord's Supper. You know, it's, it's like you're going through these motions, but they don't mean anything. You know, you're missing this part of the significance. And so, so this is something we need to remind ourselves is that um, in, in, in part, communion is a reminder of our unity in Christ. Uh, and we'll get more on about uh, the unity factor here um, later here um, in particular in, 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 a, in, a, in a couple points. We'll get more on that. But the second thing I want us to see, and this is probably what most people think of um, because they definitely come from the words of Jesus, uh, is it's a time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And back to 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 23, he says, uh, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? And then you get to the second part, verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we, we, we know from these statements Jesus made, we're to do this to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And this is a, a major focus, obviously, of the Lord's Supper and of communion, of breaking bread, is, is we're remembering what Jesus did. Now, um, that, that small little word is, is what has caused many church divisions over the years. This is my body. This is my blood, right? <laughs> what is, is, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And so, you know, and you have some, um, the Catholic tradition is going to say, well, that is means it actually be, that, that when the priest blesses that, right, it actually becomes the body of Jesus, and it actually becomes the, the, the blood of Jesus. It's almost like a reenactment of the crucifixion as his body, his real body, his actual blood, right? And then others, um, uh, Anglican churches and some Lutheran churches, would say, well, there's something called consubstantiation. And that's where it's not become it, but it kind of surrounds it. Like the body of Jesus is there present in a way, but it's not actually in those elements. Right? And then, and then, um, then you have basically, there's kind of two more. I'm just kind of laying out, I'm not laying out what these different views are. Um, our church does not hold to either of those. Okay. Um, I mean, so um, this is not a perfect argument, but I'll just say, you know, Jesus said all kinds of things. He said, I am the door. Well, he's not really a door, right? It's a metaphor. He said, there are a lot of metaphors that Jesus used, right? So he says, I am the bread, right? Or this is, this is my body. I think it's metaphorical, it seems to me. Um, and so, um, but, but, but uh, anyway, as you go on, the other, some of the other two views would be, one would be um, that, you know, the verses we read in 1 Corinthians 10, where it talks about the, you know, that word participation in, right? 
uh, participation in the, the cup and participation in the bread. Uh, there are some uh, in the, that would consider them in the Reformed camp, Reformed Church of America, and some Reformed Baptist churches would say, you know, there is something spiritual happening during communion. They say there is a spiritual benefit, right? Um, and this is where, uh, like so in Presbyterian churches as well, because they would most of them are Reformed, would say, listen, this is a means of God's grace. He, is, he blesses you somehow in partaking in that meal not in a way of salvation, but there's some spiritual communion that's happening between you and Jesus in that time, okay? Um, and, and they base that on the, the 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 passage, okay? Um, and then I would say there's kind of the more the traditional Baptist view. Um, I'm sure there's other churches that have this view that don't have the name Baptist, but that's associated with Baptist, and that is, it's, it's a symbol. It's a symbol, um, an important symbol, so not, you don't play it, downplay the symbol, uh, but it's just a symbol that there's not, there's not a spiritual benefit um, other than we're obeying what the Lord told us to do, okay? Does that make sense? Um, and so um, our church has probably been more in the, the last one I just said, more of the Baptist view, although I personally, it's my personal opinion, um, I mean... I could see whether somebody might come to the view that there might be some spiritual benefit that is gotten from there's some kind of fellowship that goes on with us and the Lord when we're taking communion. I, I, I would not be a personally, again, my personally opposed to that. Um, but there you have it. The word is, right? Uh, is, is. And you can see where, because, you know, back in John 6, we haven't even gotten there, and I'm not going on there, where, you know, Jesus talks about, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have any part of me. I mean, and, you know, so, you know, what do you do with that? And, of course, I would say it's symbolic and so on. But, you know, you get it. You get why there's differences in there, okay? Um, uh, but I definitely have a problem with Jesus doesn't need to be taken to the cross again and again by some kind of actual body and blood reenactment thing. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, I, to me, that, I, that feels like what he did was insufficient. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So um, that's probably more or more history than you wanted to know. But, but, it, but it's there, okay? And you need to know it's there because you'll run across people um, uh, in some different camps on that. Okay, so, um, so we're remembering, we're to remember uh, the sacrifice of Jesus. And again, I think this is the thing that most people um, think of when they think of communion. We're, we're focusing in and reminding ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross on our behalf. And and, uh, you know, we as believer, as believers, we need reminders constantly of the gospel and the benefits that they have brought us, what Jesus has done for us. Not just, not just salvation, but all the blessings that come from it. And, and we oftentimes, you know, when we have our community devotionals, we try to connect with those blessings and benefits of salvation, right? And so... But why do we need reminding? Why do we need reminding? And an old hymn I was reminded of <laughs> this week, uh, it's, the title of the hymn um, is Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Does anybody know that hymn? I'm not going to ask you to sing it, but tell me the old, old story. Well, verse 2 uh, gets at the reminder aspect. It says, tell me the story slowly, that I may take it in, that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Meaning just how quick we forget, right? How quick we forget. And so we need this physical reminder uh, of what Christ has done for us, and to praise God for all the blessings that come to us from that act. And so, so we need reminders like the Lord's Supper because we as humans are prone to forget. That's just the reality of it. In fact, you know, in the New and in the Old Testaments, um, God has built in uh, these different reminders uh, in different ways because um, his people are so prone to forget, right? When you think back to 
um, the Old Testament festivals, right? Well, why did they celebrate these different festivals? Because God didn't want them to forget all the things he had done, whether it be the Passover festival or whether it you know, be the Feast of Booths or whatever. Uh, you know, these were, these were times of the year that were meant to remind people so they would even remember the story of what this was connected to, right? And so, so God instituted those things in the Old Testament uh, as a means of getting, re- getting his people to remember that. Now, um, so in the New Testament, though, those events and, and that uh, accompany those memorial festivals, they come to fulfillment in Jesus, right? So we, we don't necessarily celebrate those festivals anymore because they were pointing to Jesus, right? Um, and, and, and of course, Jesus, think about this, Lord of the Sabbath, the Passover lamb, the once for all atoning sacrifice and perfect high priest, right? The word made flesh. So as a result, those ceremonies in the um, cease in the Old Testament with his coming. And so while the festival reminders cease with Jesus' arrival, the encouragement for God's people to remember still remains. Okay? In other words, we still need to remember things. Uh, and so Jesus, uh, for one, we, you know, he, and what we're focusing on today is telling us to remember him in this Lord's Supper. That's what we're to do. So we, we need to remember um, the gospel. We need to remember all the things that come to us from the gospel. And so when you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In him, meaning in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I mean, you could go on because there's, a, you know, there's just so much there in Ephesians chapter 1 about our salvation and what he has done for us. And even, uh, you know, you think about the benefit of the, the benefit is a small way to say it, but the, the blessing, the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 1.13, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? And so, so in the Lord's Supper, we celebrate our deliverance from the bondage of sin, right? It, it no longer has dominion over us because of what Jesus did. And so when we, we take those, you know, they use the word elements, right? Somebody came up with that word elements. That's just what, it's, it's standing for the bread and the, the, and the cup, the juice, right? Uh, and those are symbols of what, to remind us of what Jesus went through for us. And we take that opportunity to thank him. And because, you know, as you go through your week and we, we have communion uh, um, twice a month, right? Some churches do it every week, which is fine, you know, but, but um, we need to do it regularly for sure. Right, so uh, so our church every you know a couple of weeks uh, has this time set aside so that we will remember, right? Because as we go through our weeks and life is happening, we can lose focus. We can um, our priorities can get jumbled, or we can lose um, lose sight of what life is about. And lose sight of Jesus. And so we need to get refocused. And so I, um, um, communion serves as a means for us to remember what Christ has done for us. And he inaugurated the Lord's Supper for that reason. He said those words, do this in remembrance of me. Right? So uh, the third thing here is it's a time to remember Jesus is returning. Communion is a time uh, to remember, Jesus is returning. Um, I don't know if you caught this here, but in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11, says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Right? And so that until he comes is what I'm talking about. Because uh, we, we need to remember that we... we one day, we won't be doing this. We'll actually be sitting at a wedding feast with Jesus, okay? And so, um, it, it's just, it reminds us of our hope. It reminds us of our When you think about, you know, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for his church, for all those who have put their faith in him, 
right? Um, just as it says there in Romans um, 10, 9 and 10, right? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? And so all those who have done that, right? You have a true relationship with the living God through Jesus. He's coming back. He's coming back and he's going to um, take us with him, right? He's gone to prepare a place for us, it says, right? And so this is something to look forward to. And the thing is, is that as we, whenever we experience the pain of life and the fact that we live in a fallen world that's affected by sin, which affects our own bodies, which affects just the, the strife that we have in our world, we should be reminded this is not all there is. This is not our home as believers. Our home is with Jesus, and he's coming back, right? And so um, as, we, as we take this communion until he comes, we should remember he's coming for us, right? He's coming for us. And so that should, that should encourage us. That should bring us hope and faith, right, to continue to, to be faithful to him um, until he comes, right? And now, did you catch that too? I, I didn't make a big deal about this, but it says you proclaim the Lord's death. So when we, do, when we take the Lord's Supper together, we give a gospel presentation in, in various forms, but it, you boil it down, it's the gospel, uh, or we talk about an aspect of the gospel applied to our lives. And so that's important too, because when people are here that don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, they, they need to know how. And so having this regular time is a way that we get to proclaim the gospel, right? It's a proclamation that he died for you, that he loves you, that he wants you to know him, right? And so that's good news, and we want to share that. And so it says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we need to remember that. It's a time of remembering Jesus is returning. Um, now, in Matthew chapter, uh, let's see here, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29, it says, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Just a, another connection with our future, right? Um, so he, he's just saying, I'm going to do this, uh, in, but I'm not going to do it again until we're all together, right? So again, just another encouragement. By the way, that, that reference that he's going to prepare a place for us, if you want that, it's John 14, 3. John 14, 3, it says, he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. I think that's so cool. Jesus wants you to be with him. Did you catch that phrasing where he says, so that, so that where I am, you may be also. Like he just, he wants to be with his people. And so he's just so looking forward to that return. And so the last thing I want to mention here about communion and, uh, is that communion, it provides an opportunity for us for regular spiritual and moral examination. It's an opportunity for some self-reflection because um, you think about what is Paul telling these people? He's like, you guys are missing it, right? You are in disharmony and you're divided and so he, he tells them they ought to do some self-reflection um, to make sure that their heart is right with the Lord and with each other, by the way. In verses 27 to 34, let me just look at a couple of those verses. In verse 27 there, 1 Corinthians 11, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28 says, uh, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. So, so back up to that verse uh, 27. Whoever eats or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. By the way, nobody's worthy to drink the cup, <laughs> okay? It's not about being worthy, okay? Um, right? It's all what Christ has done that has put us in that position, right? It's by faith, right? Um, and so, but it's about drinking it in an unworthy manner. It's how we approach that time, right? How we approach that time. These guys, 
they, they were having this issue, like I described to us before, uh, that they needed to deal with this. This, this was a problem. It, 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 it was smacked right in the face of what, in, in one sense, what communion was about. Right? They're supposed to have this love feast and then followed by the Lord's Supper, and, and it's, it's about the, their unity with one another and with the Lord and, and about what Christ has done for us. And they have made a mockery of it. And so, so it's about not taking the bread and the cup and taking communion in an un worthy manner. That's the focus, okay? So I think that we should take that opportunity when we're sitting here and we have those elements and, you know, when our uh, Becky or, or, or um, uh, Kim or whoever else is playing the instrumental music, that's, that's your cue to spend some time with God examining yourself and say, is there something that I need to get right with someone else that I've carried in here, not resolved to take care of, uh, or is there something I need to confess before God that he's laid on my heart, okay? And I think that's, that's a way that we can, that we can um, uh, examine ourselves to see that we're, we're not participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, right? And so, so I, I think um, the, the verses here in Matthew chapter 5 give us a little instruction uh, on what this may be like. It says, uh, everyone ought to examine... Oh, that's verse 28, sorry. Let me get to um, verse 21. Matthew 5, 21 says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. So this is in the middle there of Jesus' right, longest sermon. It says, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says... Uh, to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift, and this is what I'm getting at here, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in the front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, and then come to offer your gift." And so as we come together, you know, our, our communion takes place in, in, as part of our worship service. We're, we're worshiping the Lord, right, even in that. So if you know that there's a brother or sister that has something against you, right, and you haven't taken action on that, try to bring, pursue reconciliation, you should go and be reconciled to your brother. Do whatever you can to pursue reconciliation. And so that's part of that, part of that self-examination in that time should be, I think, to make sure that, hey, have I, you know, and, and, and I think that um, maybe the Lord brings something to your mind as you're sitting there uh, for a communion and, and just, uh, just resolve in your heart to take care of it before you take communion. I, I think that's what you should do. I think you should resolve in your heart to take care of it, okay? And then take that action afterwards, okay? Uh, some people might take it literally and say, you know, don't take communion at all at that time. But I think if you resolved it in your heart, that you're going to do it personally, I think it's fine, okay? But if you can't resolve it in your heart, then you should not take communion that day. I think you should, you should let it go. That's okay. Um, and, and by the way, that self-examination doesn't say you're, you are to examine someone else, <laughs> right? You're not to sit there and examine someone else. So you don't worry about why they're not taking communion. You don't worry about, uh, or you think they shouldn't be taking communion, Okay? That's not your job, right? It's not. That's why I use the word self-examination, right? It's about you and your relationship with God, okay? And so uh, this is important, right? And uh, right, may, may this be our prayer here, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Uh, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. You know, that, that's... that's that, kind of can take place in that time frame there. And then, and then you can just confess it to the Lord. You, just whatever he brings to mind, right? If there's something he brings to mind, you just deal with it, right? Of course, we're, we're pleading the blood of Christ anyway, right? It's, it, there's nothing we can do to earn the forgiveness that's been purchased by the blood of Christ if we're a believer, right, for us. But, but, it, but those things do affect our relationship with God if we're living in sin. We haven't, we ha and he makes these things aware to us, and, and um, we should... Um, 
we should have regular times of confession and, and, and then just thanking the Lord for his forgiveness, okay? So there's this horizontal component of self-examination and then there's this vertical component. That's important. I think that will help us uh, take, take the cup and the bread in a worthy manner, okay? In a worthy manner. So, so these are, you know, just um, a, a few of the ways that, that point out to us the importance and the purpose of um, breaking a bread, or the Lord's Supper or communion. And so I think it's just good for us to, to be reminded this is why we do it. Because, again, we do it on a regular basis. It can be um, something that we kind of gloss over and kind of get be routine. So may the Lord refresh us uh, in this, right, as we take communion the next time and we can remember these things, okay? Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder, the breaking of bread. And we thank you so much, God, that you have given us this breaking of bread for a number of things, that it reminds us of the unity we have in Jesus, that Jesus is pulling from one loaf. We are one body in Christ because of what he did. And then, Lord, thank you also that it's a time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus uh, and what he has done, that we might not forget it and we might just turn that little meal, if you will, the Lord's Supper, into just a time of thanksgiving. And Lord, that we also would remember it's to remind us that Jesus is coming back again for us. And Lord, also, it's a time for us to do business with you and to resolve to do business with each other that's left undone. And so Lord, we pray for your help in these things, God. Pray that you'd help us to, to celebrate that Lord's Supper in a, in a manner that's worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Greg. Let's let's stand and sing. Jesus 
God is the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Let's praise him one last song. Stop 
the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing it over the battle. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Stop the Lord Almighty. Oh, can stop the Lord. awesome great thank you good song choices love those listen thanks for worshiping with us today